So first, I just want to introduce Conservation International, because many of you might not have heard of the organization. Um, it's an international conservation nonprofit organization based in Arlington, Virginia. Um, our basic slogan is uh, yeah, that nature doesn't need people, people need nature. So it's all about making the case for why we need nature as a human race to survive. And um, what we do, I mean, we, we're basically trying to protect nature, the most essential parts of nature that we need for human well-being. And so we do it mostly in the tropics, but globally, um, depending on you know, where we're working or where we need, uh, where the natural capital is, and I'll explain that later. Um, but really, it's about sustainability and building global sustainability. And this is, again, this is just our mission statement. So really, it is empowering societies to um, live sustainably, grow sustainably, and doing that with a natural focus. We work, like I said, mostly in the tropics, but our main focus is America, Africa, Asia, and Pacific. And um, we do a wide, a wide range of work from policy to science, and I'll explain a little bit as well. We, these are um, the areas that we work, so if you're doing research in these areas, let me know. <laughs> um, at like our main, in the blue, light blue, are our priority areas where we're focusing a lot of our work. All those circles are all of our field offices around the world. So we have in-country presence in most of the places that we're working. And we have 25 field offices, and we have investments in more than 30 countries globally. At our headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, we have four main divisions. So first is the Betty and Gordon Moore Science for, um, Center for Science, and that's where Jenny and I work in the Science Division. We have the Environmental Leadership in Business. So this group, they engage with mostly um, corporations, businesses. They're trying to convince businesses. Well, a lot of them don't need convincing. They are on board with sustainability, so helping them achieve sustainable targets. Um, so that they work mostly with big, big um, corporations who are doing a lot of sourcing and, doing, and can make a huge impact if they can be sustainable in where they're sourcing their raw materials. They have the Center for Oceans and they do a lot of marine protected areas, um, developing protected areas, and uh, sustainable fisheries work and also blue carbon work as well. And our environment, Center for Environmental and Peace, this group does a lot of policy work, climate policy, that are at every climate convention, COP, um, you, you name it. And they also, this is the group that works with indigenous populations, and that's been a long history of Conservation International for more than 30 years that we've always engaged indigenous organizations, indigenous people, and to work with them for uh, solutions to conservation. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview about our science division, the kind of work that we do in the science division. And most of it is about where, um, looking for where the essential places where there's food, water, and energy we need for people. And where are these places? Where do we want to make conservation investments? So this is a lot of our research is based on this question. And I'm going to highlight a couple of the research projects within the science group. One is mapping natural capital. So natural capital, again, is natural areas that provide essential ecosystem services for human well-being. Now this is um, water, uh, freshwater regulation, biodiversity, um, also uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, biomass, so carbon sequestration, and finding out where those places are. So we may need to make sure we're protecting them and we're sustaining, or if we're not protecting them, we're sustainably developing those areas. Oh, that was. And then the next project, um, again, building off of the where na mapping natural capital uh, is valuing natural capital. So this is, what is the dollar sign to those areas? How much are those worth in resources? And then going ahead, like we did in Peru, working with the governments and uh, private sector and in the countries and saying, okay, well, based on all of the natural resources, here's the value of this land. Um, and then you can make that choice. If a mining company says, we want to we mine, we'll give you this amount of money, you can take the short-term profit or in the long term, if the, the land is actually much more valuable because of the fresh water provision you get from it, and, um, and you might want to choose, wait a second, in like 10 years, it's actually more profitable for us to invest in conservation and not sell off this land to mining companies. So it's all about 
um, giving this information, making uh, this information available to the governments, in this case for the government of Peru, so that they really know what the value of their resources are. Um, also designing tools and methods to identify threats to nature and actually management strategies. And an example here is, so Jenny and I worked on a project in the Madagascar in this tiny little protected area, actually not that tiny, but it's in a tiny part of Madagascar, there's um, this forest in, um, called the, I can never say it, Akahemi Lahemina Corridor in Madagascar. And what we did there is we looked at all of these conservation investments that happened, like 800 of them over the last eight years. I mean, there was a lot of investments in this one tiny area because there's not much forest left in Madagascar. It's a very precious, high biodiversity. The people living near it really need the, the forest to survive, but at the same time, they're just, the, a lot of the agriculture is slash and burn, is moving, eating away at the forest. So we tried to evaluate, um, are these investments working? Are they stopping deforestation? Are they not? Um, what's going on? What are the better management solutions for this landscape? So that's particularly one of the studies I looked at. Another colleague of ours looked at actually what are the livelihood benefits of these studies? The people who get investments from conservation, the, the local communities, are they better off? Do they perceive that their lives are better off with the conservation of this area? And Jenny led a project that was more about policy scenarios and looking at land planning and future uh, deforestation scenarios. So under different policy scenarios that the Madagascar government are thinking of doing, um, what are the what is the actual outcome as far as where is the deforestation going to happen when they put in a road somewhere or when they do um, intensify rice production in another area? So um, she led that work there in the same this place in Madagascar. And then of course the other thing we do we develop tools um, and we use technology to monitor places that are important in this world for conservation. And that's where I finally get to where I was going to talk about, which is the tool Firecast. Um, it's an early warning system. It's a designed to really empower local stakeholders with the information from satellites. So near real-time satellite information, you know, fires, deforestation, fire forecasting, fire danger forecasting. But while like active fire data is freely available, it's you know, it's, it's there in a the server, and you can grab it. But these people who we work with, who are protected area managers on the other side of the world, they don't, they can't grab it. They, they don't have access to this information. Some of them, they, most of them don't know it exists. So it's all about that. How do you make it available to them? Because they need it to make decisions that will actually prevent deforestation. And, and so having this information is key. And having the information in, in a format they can use, that's what's important for them. So that's the point of Firecast. And um, as I mentioned, well, as Forrest mentioned, this is a, a NASA Roses, it's a Wild and Fires um, funded project. And so I'm that fence here <laughs> because he manages the Wild and Fires grant. Um, we're in our final year of this project. And so right now I'm just going to kind of talk about what we've done over the last couple of years um, and how, the, how our system is being used um, in the countries we operate. So, um, of course, the overall goal of Firecast is very aligned with the Conservation International, what our mission is. We're trying to reduce deforestation, degradation, global emissions, we want to mitigate climate change, we want to preserve ecosystem services and biodiversity, and of course there's the human well-being aspect of the work that we're doing. So it aligns very nice with what CI is trying to accomplish, and we focus on fires because fires um, are destructive and degrade, they degrade the landscape, once an area is burned, it's more likely to burn again, so we want to prevent the, um, these forests from being burned. These are not fire ecosystem, natural fire ecosystems. They do not burn on their own. Once these forests uh, never, uh, they, they don't recover from fires. So um, it's key to stop them from happening. And of course, once an area is burned, then people come in and they can do more legal forest extractive activities within the forest because it clears access to forests. And again, the carbon emissions is another another uh, effect of the fires in the in tropical forests. So we know this. We also know that there's a lot of challenges in these landscapes where we work for preventing um, fire um, disaster. A lot of it has to do with lack of timely information and inaccurate information. 
uh, limited capacity and resources, there's not a lot of capacity in these protected areas and within the governments to even do anything about it if they have the information. Um, a lot of it was before they have they didn't have the evidence that there was actually a lot of fires or uh, slash and activity going on, so they couldn't present that to policymakers and say, we know this is happening, because they just didn't have the ability to, to show them um, proof. And then a, a lot of it, a lot of it is just lack of education and awareness. I mean, most of the fires in Madagascar are just purely for fun. And <laughs> that's like the people, um, a lot of them are burning our cultural lands, but it's a way that they celebrate, and it's a way that they protest politics. They burn land. Totally unnecessary, like what we think, but that they don't know, um, they, they don't understand the consequences, and that's just kind of criminal culture. So a lot of it is education, education, and teaching people um, why these sort of practices need to be changed. So our approach is we have this uh, early warning alert system. It's very customized. We only operate in five countries. So you see it's uh, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Indonesia, and Madagascar because we have office field offices in these countries where we have technical leads who, um, who are the leads for Firecast. They engage directly with the users, with people in the government. They build trust within country. A lot of these countries do not like external systems. They do not want a US-based system. Um, they don't trust them. So they want, they want uh, someone in country. We build trust with them. We get them engaged. We help, we, they build the system with us and we improve it based on their feedback. And that is really key which is why everyone always says, why don't you go global? Because that's not what it's about. Because if we go global, we would lose that contact with local users who wouldn't be able to customize it for their needs. So there is a reason that we only have a couple, um, we work in a couple of countries right now. Um, and we do, we have, so we have this information, and the other way we disseminate that is, we used to have an alert system, a fire alert system, before the Firecast project. We, uh, with this NASA funding, we got to overhaul it and then also create a whole another a suite of products that were um, to meet different users' needs. So not just email alerts, and I'll go through the different types of products from the system, because we have different users from local communities to uh, environmental funding agencies who manage big grants for where investments are made. Um, so right now we have about more than 800 users, mostly as you see in Madagascar, because we've done this extensive outreach engagement in Madagascar starting back in 2005. Our first system, fire alert system, was launched there. We built it with the Madagascar government. So we still have a lot of users who are pretty loyal to the system in Madagascar. So I'm just going to talk about some of the products and give some stories about how these products are used. As I said, fire alerts, email alerts, um, where the fires are happening and the uh, coordinates. I mean, again, this is firm's data, the Modus and Beer's data. And we also have quick uh, forest disturbance alerts produced by Chris Potter and Vanessa Giovese. I don't know if I said her name right, but Vanessa <laughs> as well. And so um, we have these two types of alerts, and in mostly where they're used by local and national governments. And responding to threats, uh, strategizing patrols and protected areas, they cannot address every fire, but they will strategize based on where most of them are, or, or they see activity building up on one side of the park, they'll send more people over there to, to address the issues. Um, stopping legal activity, as I said, and actually the fears I'm going to say that are used to collect fines, so they, some governments like Bolivia, they use the information to collect fines from landowners who are burning when they're not supposed to be, so like the, when they're burning during no burn time. Um, so that's another application. This picture here is just one of the workshops we had in March with the government, with the protected area um, organization, and it's a government organization that's focused on protected areas in Peru. So we did, we've done extensive capacity building that reach with this particular group, um, and these were all a bunch of the managers in one region of Peru. Another example, um, a use of fire alerts in communities, and this is, uh, I like this example because it's a really creative example. Uh, this was actually a couple of years ago, but uh, in Madagascar, we, when we only had the alert system, we had, uh, there was this organization, Durrell Wildlife Trust, and they're like a nonprofit organization, but they had a project working in Valley Bay in Madagascar. Valley Bay is kind of up on the northern coast, and there's a little protected area. And in Valley Bay, there's an endangered tortoise species called the plowshare tortoise. 
highly endangered. There's only 2,000 individuals left in the wild. So this is one area where they live. Fires are a huge threat to this protected area. So um, the Terrell Wildlife Trust, they devised a fun competition between the two villages that live near the protected area. And they said, okay, well, if we send you, they had to fax the email alerts to them because they don't have internet. So they faxed it because they, <laughs> they had a phone line. Um, and they faxed the coordinates. And then they, they said, okay, by the end of the year, whoever, whichever village is better at putting out fires gets a prize. So by the end of the year, they tallied up the results. And the, the winning village, they got a development project of their choice. I think it was either school building, a solar panels, or a well for drinking. So I mean, it's a great example of, they, they thought, you know what? We have an issue in this area. Let's engage the communities. Let's get them involved, take ownership over protecting this area, this natural, um, this uh, protected area, and protecting this tourist. So it was a really good way to, I think, creatively to engage communities in conservation. All right, so another project we have, and this is new with the, with the, the latest Firecast grant, grant, is the dashboards, which we actually call Firecast Analytics. Um, so this is like we can look at, uh, visualize uh, beers and modus data, customize date range. So anyone, you don't need GIS, you, don't need, you, know, you just go in, choose your date range, choose where you want to see the fire information, how many fires have happened in that area. It shows trends for um, what are the last five years of, of trends of fires in the area they're interested in, and uh, different breaks it down different ways, pie charts, um, and we produce reports. So this information is, is that most people want the, the actual CV, uh, CSV outputs because they can't use shapefile data or they don't know how GS data, but if you just, they just want the number of fires happening in these areas. So for instance, we were working with the Bolivian government and they, gave, they um, wanted us to do this inside their forestry zones, which is not a typical, it's not an administrative unit, but so they gave us their forestry zone data and they wanted us to just generate reports within their forestry zones. Well, they were doing this, generating reports and they could act, output the data and then they can you know, do whatever they want with it um, in, in an Excel or make a report from it, which is really great. And I actually use it a lot too because I used to go to firms and download historical data just to, to generate some of these graphs and now I just go here and I can just just within like a seconds get the information without having to go get, go to firms, download it, and then put it in a you know, DBF and then subset it and then just do it in Excel. So save me time too. Um, but this particular tool, the, um, we actually, we built it and then we, we targeted a certain audience, which is the environmental fund audience. So this, these are environmental funds, they have a lot of money where they grant out for conservation. They determine where they're, they determine where they want to invest and then they grant it to governments or organizations locally. And um, Conservation National engages with a lot of these organizations but, um, but they weren't monitoring regularly what's happening in these investment sites. So we told them we can build them their own automated reporting, so just generate automated reports of their whole portfolios. Most of their portfolios, um, some are global with like hundreds of sites, and some are more local, maybe have like 30 sites. But this was key, and we went to, uh, there's a annual conference or meeting of the Latin America Environmental Funds last year. We've met with a lot of them. We have three on board where we're just we're generating reports for. And they they said to us, they said, well, we've heard of this, you know, using fires from satellites or you know, deforestation data, but we just don't know how to do it. We don't have the capacity. They have zero technical capacity. They're a bunch of finance people. And so they were really excited that we could just show them how to use this and how to access this data. Um, so that was really great, kind of introducing a whole new um, group to this information. Okay, so the other, um, the other project we have, fire weather, so fire weather, fire danger forecasting. And this is something that actually developed in a previous NASA grant back, it started in 2001, developing this model for um, fire danger in the Amazon. And you can see here, uh, picture, I'm not a trigger. But anyway, this was the original window that I built the model for back in the early 2000s, and it was running for Bolivia. We did field testing in Bolivia, and then it was just running on the line every day, just pulling modus and trim data and generating. Um, it was based on the US Forest Service fire danger weather equations and just generating this risk. Um, and we were, we were putting in a risk index. And then through this um, grant opportunity, this grant actually worked for us because. Um, 
I needed to expand the window to cover other um, countries in, in uh, South America, but you know, my server couldn't handle that much, <laughs> like that much area. It just wasn't, I was working on a local server. So that's where I used Next, because I could then expand the model using the modus data Next, um, switch the trim out for the GPM data, I up overhauled it because a lot of the old code was, it was pretty old. So, um, so it, was, it was a great opportunity to be able to test it, and that's what I did. I tested it and Next, got it working for all of this whole window, and then from there, moved it to Amazon Cloud through, with uh, Global Forest Watch. Uh, the fires initiative and little resources to and so we moved it from next to their cloud and then expanded it to all of South America and in Asia as well and that's where it's running now on their cloud. So this uh, in this case of this model was from the start when we, we did the field testing in Bolivia we, we were working with this uh, organization Fundación Amigos de la Naturaleza and they were doing our field work for us and then they were using the daily outputs of, what, of the original model um, and generating a national fire danger weather index and they had this whole website um, and then the key there is they were a local living organization they were engaging the communities directly they were going and talking with the farming communities teaching them about fire danger most communities had no idea um, that uh, to not burn during heightened you know droughts you know drought or fire weather and, and they had to go and teach them how like, you know, could spread into the forest or your property. And they did extensive work with this community, which was absolutely fantastic. And this is where it's really key sometimes. You need that on the ground local uh, connection to connect with the communities who are who we need to engage. That's not something that we did. We just built the model. But we had that key partner who could go take the extra step and, and engage with communities. Now they have actually built their own um, uh, they don't use ours anymore because they built their own which is fantastic because a lot of the work we do is building the capacity and we're happy that they have their own model and they built their own system and um, and it works really well and that we helped you know help them get there as well so that's a you know great success story um, we also have a mobile app um, originally it was a field data collection app to, to uh to uh, validate the quick data um, and then it, now it's we just made an open free version where you can go on and it's just, it's only for um, Android, but you can just see the near real time fire data here and, and MODIS and also the, the quick use forestation data as well. Um, but this is great because even everywhere we go, if we show people the app, they get really excited. I'm sure there's other apps that do the same thing, but like, they get really excited. It's like, oh my God, I can see fires right next to me. I'm like, yes, of course. And so it's, it's more of, this is a, kind of a tool for awareness and, um, and so people are more aware of, it, of the fires and just the fact that they can see fires from satellites. Most people don't know they can see fires from satellites. So um, it's a great uh, tool for that. And I was really excited, the giddy this year because Leonardo DiCaprio tweeted about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I was kind of like a little excited. But uh, yeah, so we did a blog about this app and um, and he did a tweet of it. He retweeted it uh, like nine months later, but still, <laughs> he retweeted it. And, that, and then I was, so I was like, and they said, you know, Karen, they have people that do that for him. I, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought I had a personal connection with him. But anyway. <laughs> but he has, what, like millions of, 17 million filers? So that's pretty cool. And it mentioned NASA, like it was, and so it was really focused on. I thought the title of, uh, in it, it talks about NASA satellites monitoring fires, so that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, so then, of course, Interactive Web Map, everyone has a web map, but it's one of the products. But again, this is more outreach and awareness, um, and you, know, you can kind of zoom around and look at different protected areas and key biodiversity areas. Uh, we also have these maps that we, we have, just like pre-made, really nice uh, PDF maps that show historical fire trends. And we actually have a lot of people download these because they yeah, don't have mapping abilities, they don't have JS capacity, but they, they download these and they, they bring them to the governments and they to the fund in policy discussions and say, look what's going on in these areas. So, and, and everything we have on this, I don't know if I, maybe it's in this one, but everything we have is translated into the local language by somebody, not by a, you know, like a computer. So it's, 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 it's all just like, you know, native language, they can get all this information. 
and they use it in their policy discussions. So <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about outreach and engagement. Uh, about half of what we do is system development, which is building all these products, but the other half is outreach and engagement. And maybe you can probably do more than half outreach engagement because you can build something you know, to the outreach. And I was going to use this, as everyone knows. Um, so we spend a lot of time doing workshops, capacity building. Um, we see we have here, we've, over the last three years, we've done 13 capacity building workshops in the five countries we operate in, a lot of blogs. Um, but that, that is really key to engaging, getting feedback, improving the system. And, um, and along, every time we go, we do, we do Firecast workshops, but we just don't talk about Firecast. We talk about all the tools available, the Forest Watch, and, you know, firms. We're not there to sell our product because we know that there's not one solution for everyone. So it's kind of like, here's all that you can do. Here's all the tools available. Pick whatever you like. Um, and this is what you can do with near old times with observation data. We also tag on most of these workshops with capacity building, actually training GIS from what sensing. With last two workshops, we did Indonesia and Madagascar. We um, did a, a session on using SAR data and to detect burn scars and trying to do burn scar mapping because a lot of that's one of the needs of burn scar mapping. So we even though we can't produce um, the product that they need um, automatically, but we basically like, well, we can give you the tools and show you maybe how to use optical and SAR because it's very very cloudy where they are. So again, they can't rely just on Landsat. There's you barely get any Landsat looks. Um, so yeah, just trying to always build the capacity when we go into these workshops. And here's just a couple of the workshops this year, like I said, we, this year we, we did the workshops in Peru, Madagascar, Indonesia. Previous year was oh, at Colombia and Madagascar. So every year we're very busy conducting a lot of workshops and capacity building sessions, but it's key to engage with the users. Um, despite all this, we still have a lot of challenges, and the users have challenges to using this information, internet is definitely an issue. Slow speeds, accessing the internet, um, low technical capacity, just even devices, not even having you know, mobile phones or GPS. They don't have smartphones, they don't have GPS, they don't have computers, and that's really challenging. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the political support in these countries, that's always hard because where we worked in Bolivia, there's overturn of the government like every two years, I swear, it's just, complete shuffle in and out. And every time you try, you build capacity, you can get people engaged, and they're really excited, and then they're just gone, and then new people are in there, and they need to work again. So after we went through several cycles of this, we just <laughs> were like, okay, we didn't think of something new. So we decided instead of this continual like, engagement, we're just gonna try to do a social media campaign, because apparently only, they, people only look at Facebook there, so they do everything through Facebook. So I'm like, oh, if we just make a Facebook page, and we can continually educate them through Facebook, which is, might be a low-cost effort and solution to always going and training up people in the government every two years. And then, of course, Madagascar is another one where political instability is an issue. And when we built the original system with the Madagascar government, we had their stamp of approval. Um, our, our alert system was on the government website, but they would say, go here, and they link to Constitution International. Um, and they had, uh, there were just huge supporters, but then there's coup and the, the president was overthrown and then just threw up everything and there's just constant change. And so that's that's always a challenge in many of these countries that work in. Um, so the other challenges are just lack of exposure to the data. Like I said, a lot of people still don't know. You can look at, you can see fires from space or, and they just don't know these tools are available, the data is available. So just telling them about it and how to access it. Um, and how to, and lack of how to use the information. One example is this, so we had the fire danger model, and for the last two years we've been going to Peru saying, you can use this model, look that we built it, and now we expanded it, and next, and you know, expanded to Peru, so you can use this information, and they always just look at it like, okay, uh-huh, and then they never used it, they, they just couldn't, they couldn't figure out how to use it, um, but then this last year in Peru, there's a horrible, horrible fires in December. Um, and it's actually outside of the fire season, so just really destructive, massive like, fires out of control. Then after that, followed up with massive floods and landslides because of all the degraded uh, landscape and huge rain. <coughs> and then they came back and said, can you tell us about that virus model again? Because they wanted, to, they were like, okay, I get it, we need to use it. We just didn't really need to use it before, now we need to. So then in 
uh, March, we went back to Peru, that was that workshop, and we sat down with the Pajari people, again, showed them how to, to use the index. I mean, we realized that we need more locally relevant. We need to make it easier for them to use, just given that index is not the most user-friendly thing for them. So we're trying to work out with them, how can we give this information to you that you can use it, what really means high risk versus low risk. And it was a great workshop because we actually, it was a great discussion to talk about, people got together and said, I'm not just that we need more of their systems, we need this forecasting information. But then how do we also manage it? How do we work together? And how, can we do some community-based monitoring? So they, they're just having all these discussions about um, how to handle it, be, be more, um, just be prepared for these disasters. Because it was, it was really, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw in the news about the Peru landslides and the, and the fires, but it was really devastating. And, um, and so they, they were, we needed to do something about it. So um, it was great to have that workshop and get people together to talk about being prepared. So um, just a, a review of, of our system. Like, so really, there's a bunch of systems now, early warning systems out there. Um, we used to be one of the few, but now there's a lot. And that's great, because there's a lot of needs, and there's a lot of different needs. Uh, but our niche role is we're strategic, we're targeted, we're engaging directly with with people in the countries where we work, and we make it customizable so people can use it in the way that they need to use So we know that um, a lot of people won't do something if it takes any effort at all or just any little stumbling block, they just won't use it. And um, so that's why we just we then go and say, well, what, what do you need? What, how can we help? We'll do it for you. Um, so that's that's a big part of it, just direct engagement. Oh, we built through bottom-up, like I said, direct engagement with local stakeholders. Uh, we have a lot of customized products for different local stakeholders, from local communities to large environmental funds, and hopefully also pushing them to the private sector real quick. Higher level tools just for monitoring. And um, in country engagement through our field offices, we like to take the latest research products from the research community from you guys. So, um, <coughs> including the, the quick forest disturbance was great. We have, I forgot to mention on the slide, we have the fire season severity forecast as well on the Chen and All paper. And we, pull those in and put those on the website. Uh, every time Wilford produces a new algorithm for fires, we can pull that in and waiting for the Lanza. Um, so, and one thing about that is, um, so when Wilford produced the Veers active fire alert alerts, uh, we actually had a workshop, we, we put in our system, and we had a workshop in Madagascar in like September, I forgot what year it was now, it was two years ago, right? Um, and we introduced people in Madagascar to Veers, which was great because then they, would be like, what is this new product? Because sometimes when something new comes along, it's just like, I don't know how to use it, and they don't use it. They probably wouldn't have used it in firms. If the firms came up and they didn't do it, without our direct engagement, they would not even bother using fears and firms, but we talked to them and told them what it's about. And we did this all in like September, and it actually was six months later that it was fears was released in the United States for, for like general use. So we were like six months ahead of the US release which was great, and Amber was like, she's like, so people in Madagascar had it first? And I was like, yeah, they have it. But that's just because we're directly engaging the research community and, and trying to just use the, the latest products. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, everything's translated from native speakers, and that is very key, especially when you're working like Bahasa Indonesian, and, um, and, and these translators just don't work for that at all. So that's kind of what we, we have as our system, and that's kind of the role that our system plays. And a couple of like, next steps to present to you guys. Um, right now, uh, we're expanding our fire weather um, to the pan tropics through Global Forest Watch. And uh, we still have, you know, with the connectivity, we're trying to explore ways to send people alerts through messaging apps. And because everyone in the country works use Facebook, we're trying to use Facebook Messenger, so we're gonna pilot that out. Um, how to just actually you know, alert people of fires using their Facebook. Um, fire the forecast is something that I was working with Matt and Jolly. We had a proposal that we wrote together with Mark Afghan. <laughs> but and but there's but it was it was it was great to have that collaboration on doing the uh, one week out forecast for fire weather. Um, and that's something definitely that that people request, our users request, and making and part of that proposal is making these indices locally relevant. So was it really Low. It means different. It's different for everywhere in the world. So what does that mean globally? Um, and making it easy for 
people making decisions to uh, take in that information and make and decide and take action based on that information. Uh, burned area is something we get a lot. I know there's burned global burned area products, and there is lens that burned area. But like I said, there's tons of clouds, and we we're sort of trying to uh, test out how to use our data. And try to, you know, so we don't have to worry about clouds, but getting an automated product um, together is something that I like to ask <laughs> the research community to look into. Um, and then. Uh, I also explore fire radio power, which is something that now, because it's part of, you know, it's just a field in the beers and modus data, and seeing what can you tell about, with the accuracy, can you tell if the fire is in a forest or agricultural land? Because that would make a huge difference um, if someone wants to go out and, and just, it makes a difference for someone who wants to go and investigate it, but also um, when we're using, because I actually use the Modus fire data for uh, impact evaluation, and I was trying to see did uh, deforest uh, did uh, fires where there was a reduction in fires with conservation investments. But it's kind of tricky because with the modus pixel, the fires could be a lot of the fires happen at the edge. So I don't know if they're happening inside or outside the forest. So is there a way to figure out if it was forest or not forest that was being burned? Um, and of course, uh, lands such uh, OLI active fires. So. Thank you, and um, if you have any questions about Concert International, about Firecast,